Part two of the crossover. Josh Neighbors here for Locked On Bay 12. John Williams is here from Locked On Sooners. Emery Lina from Locked On Texas Tech. And also Jake Hatch. He is here from Locked On Cougars. The Big 12, the coaches, how do they stack up against each other? And also, if we were to add the big, the new Big 12 coaches in right now, where would they rank amongst the current coaches against each other? It's a really interesting question. We'll have some conversation about that and also – some all Big 12 teams are released from Athlon Sports. Some thoughts on those coming up on today's show. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, once again, Josh Neighbors here, John Williams here, Emery Lida here, and Jake Hatch is here. Whether you're watching us on YouTube or you are listening to us, uh, whichever way you like to, we're happy to have you. So last, well, like a couple weeks ago, uh, I had talked about the uh, CBS Sports Power 5 coach rankings. And I, w- I hadn't even done part two of that show yet, actually. And so they released their top 25 rankings. They had three Big 12 coaches top 25. Matt Campbell was 12. Dave Aranda was 11. Mike Gundy was number 10. This set of all the Power 5 coaches It got me thinking, you know, about when we do add the new coaches and really like the new coaches we're adding. I mean, there is some heavy hitters here, guys. You think about number one, I think about Luke Fickle, right? That is a coach that has been to a college ball playoff in a program like Cincinnati. It's really and and once again, I've mentioned this a bunch. The effort they put up against Alabama is a lot better than a lot of the efforts that we see from better branded schools against Alabama. Um one Gus Malzahn has is a coach that has been very close to you know uh, winning the whole damn thing. Uh, did so as a coordinator, right? As uh, for that uh, that Auburn team, and had and, and also has beaten Nick Saban a fair fair amount of times on his in his own right, correct? Then you think about uh, you know Dana Holgerson, who we don't have to you know, look at his credentials at West Virginia. We don't have to know about this guy winning games this conference. He's won a bunch, right? So you think about all of them, and you obviously think about Kalani Sataki, who was a candidate for many Power 5 jobs and has kept things rolling there at BYU. So, Jake, I'll go to you first. When you think about that, you think about the Arandas of the world, you think about Gundy, you think about Matt Gamble, they're, uh, you know, they're all different kind of coaches because of the tenure that they've been there, the ups, the downs they had, the different kinds of programs. But where do you see a Kalani Sataki fitting into the – current kind of big 12 hierarchy of coaches i'd put him top half i think it's pretty easy to put him there and that that, that, the fun part about a guy like kalani is you mentioned the fact he's had power five interests they're they're the last two off seasons byu fans have been fretting oh is kalani gonna bolt and Kalani, the one thing about him is he grew up a BYU guy. He was a fan of the program. He played for Lavelle Edwards in pro. It was his dream his entire life to play there. He wants to find a reason to stay at BYU. He's not a guy who's looking to leave. And that, that's the nice part of, about a program like BYU in the football sense is they have a guy who is invested in this program. They've also put unprecedented amount of money into the program this offseason as well. They're anticipating uh, really being able to go into the Big 12 on a pretty even footing if they're able if they're capable of doing that with regards to being competitive so a lot of things are looking up for BYU I think I would probably put Kalani in that four to five range somewhere in that top half of the big 12 so because it's really funny because you know I so I think about those like three guys at the top right the the Arandas the Gundys and then and then Matt Campbell uh John if you had to rank those three right now in order where would you put them and also, if you were to add Luke, so I want you to do the non-Luke Fickle and then Luke Fickle. Just rank them really fast. Actually, toss Luke Fickle in there. Where would you put Luke Fickle in relation to those guys? So give me like those four. Put them in order for me. I think I'd have to put Luke Fickle, and then Gundy, Aranda, Campbell. You put you put Fickle over Gundy. I yeah, think that's interesting. I think so. Hmm. I, I mean, just what he's able to do at Cincinnati and. and I mean, they had some really, really quality wins last year to get them into the college football playoff. Or the last did he, two years, I would say. Yeah, too. The last, I mean, they could have gone, yeah, two years ago too. So I think what he's done in such a short period of time is part of the reason that the Big 12 was willing to bring Cincinnati into the fold. Like, it wasn't just because they are in a, a football state with a football footprint like Ohio has. 
I mean, Cincinnati had to play well on the field as well. They had to have some level of success. And Luke Fickle brought that to Cincinnati. And another guy that's been in line that could have had a, a number of Power 5 jobs this year had he wanted to leave, but is going to follow the Bearcats, presumably, into the Big 12. And I think just his credentials and his success, I think that's what puts him a step above. I mean, the only group of five team to make it into the college football playoff. That has to mean something when – Gundy, Aranda, and Campbell haven't. You know, Gundy is a great coach. He's been at Oklahoma State for 17 years, had a lot of success, but he's also fallen short on a lot of occasions. I mean, his longevity is kind of what makes him such an attractive coach. Aranda, he's he was great in year two. Year one was kind of a dumpster fire. Yes, Are we going to yeah. see a bit of regression in year three? Are they going to fall back to middle of the pack? We'll see. Matt Campbell. That's the team that was supposed to dethrone Oklahoma last year, live up to that top 10 billing, had all the talent in the, in the world, and they fell flat. So I, he's the one, actually, Matt Campbell, and I love Matt Campbell. I think he's a great coach, but he's the one that I'm wondering, how is he considered a top 15 coach right now after what we just saw out of his Iowa State program? Yes, there were some issues. Brock Purdy That's had some injuries. Point. But I think That's this is a point. team that was supposed to be a lot better than what they ended up being. Why are we still kind of riding that Matt Campbell train? They had yeah. a little bit of regression. Can they bounce back and, and be better than they were last year, considering they lost Brock Purdy and Brees Hall and uh, Charlie Kolar and Chase out? Like, this, that's a lot of talent out the door. Mike Rose, like, this is a lot of talent that they lost. Yes, they've got some good guys still there, but I mean, they lost a lot of guys. And so, listen, I like all three, all three of the Big 12 coaches that were there, but for my money, I'm taking Luke Fickle. Like that's the guy I think that's got the ability to raise Cincinnati to becoming a consistent national title contender. So the Matt Campbell thing is is really interesting because, I, you know, I was talking with Robbie Triano and, and my, my buddy works at Sirius XM. He really he's he's kind of with you, John. Like there is a group of people that were like, where in the hell was the slander for them last year? Right? I mean, they got absolutely thumped by Iowa in a game where I was off. No, this happened a lot. Iowa's offense didn't have to do a whole lot because Iowa State gave that game away. Now, Iowa State lost that football game like outright. And that was like the big game they, you know, they had to get over. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, like maybe you're right. Maybe he's not a top 15 coach. I, I will say the reason why I would put Gundy one, and I actually think if you add in the new Big 12 coaches, I think Mike Gundy is the best coach in this league is because if you were to pick a new Big 12 school, out of the new Big 12 teams and say, all right, you have to build – you want to be like one of these programs. Oklahoma State is the program that you want to be the most like, correct, out of the new Big 12 schools. Well, who built that thing? Mike Gundy did. That is that is his program from the word go. Now, Matt Campbell's is too – or excuse me, uh, and his is, and so is Luke Fickle. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying the reason I'd go for Mike Gundy is because he's done it for a bit longer. So, Emery, do you agree with that as somebody's, you know – Who's going to who covers a team that's going to be in the new Big Twelve? Like, if you're Joey McGuire, you're trying to build in Lubbock what we've seen Mike Gundy build in Stillwater. I think I'd still go with Luke Fickle. I mean, right. you look at what <laughs> you look at what Cincinnati did last year, and their peak as a program relative to the talent that they had on that team. Like, you have to say Desmond Ritter was really well developed in that program. You look at all of the yes. school position players. Their lines on both ends were simply above what we've seen from really any Secondary group of five two. program. Yeah, that we've seen from any group of five program in recent memory. Obviously, Luke Fickle's first couple of years at Cincinnati, we've seen just a continued development of that team. It's like they improve every single year and find new stratospheres to reach. And so, like, and the other thing with Fickle as well is like he's reached that point where Cincinnati, yes, they had good resources compared to the rest of the American, but he's put them on a tier above any of the new arrivals from the American conference and talking about Houston and UCF in the last couple of years, really without, a, without much of an advantage because UCF always had the big brand coming from their success in 2017, 2018, as well as a little bit in 2013. And then as you have Houston as well as kind of been up in the upper echelon on a group of five teams for the last couple of decades, like in general, what we've seen Luke Fickle do at Cincinnati is enough to sort of surpass Mike Gundy. And the other thing is you look at how Mike Gundy's built Oklahoma state and yes, they have built themselves into a really good program. There's no denying that, but at the same time, 
you have to look at the fact that prior to last year, Oklahoma State had been on a little bit of a downturn the last the three years previously. And it's not like those teams were untalented. You look at what he did from 2017 to 2019 in particular. Those were three teams that arguably had a lot more talent. I look at 2017, 2017 they came in as a top four team on Sports Illustrated cover, completely underwhelming. You look at what they did in 2018 as well, and they went from a top 25 team in the preseason to unranked and nearly missed out on a bowl game. So, like, there's so much that Gundy has had where over the years he's had too many stumbles for me to consider him. And 2020 a was bad coach. too. I mean, I know it was yeah. COVID and everything, but like that team should have been yeah. a lot better than it was. Yeah. So, like, there's just so many stumbles along the road for Gundy that it's hard for me to say he's the best coach. Aran- so, I'd say among the three existing members behind Fickle, I would go with the, um, Aranda and Gundy in the same tier because Aranda does have the kind of lack of experience lack of proven sustainability but what we saw last year was incredible so those two are there and then i'm with you guys when it comes to matt campbell i mean we've had five years i always say it's a really good story and what he was able to do to initially build that program out of the gutters but he's had teams that have underachieved now multiple years we've seen last year came in kind of second in command to oklahoma completely underwhelming underwhelmed expected did not live up to expectations We've seen them start slow numerous times. Now we see them lose the games they shown it. We've seen Brock Purdy regress in that system. I just have no reason to think he's a top 20 coach nationally. And really, I'm debating putting him on a tier closer to the Sonny Dykes of the world than I am. Oh, him oh, towards oh, putting him for. Toward... <laughs> okay, whoa, hear me out on this. Hear, no, hear me out no. on this. No, okay. no, no. I'm not saying he's as bad as Sonny Dykes. I think there's a clear oh, line there. What goodness. I'm saying is. Look, Luke Fickle has built himself in Cincinnati and done way more in three or four years at Cincinnati than what Matt Campbell has been able to do at Iowa State. And again, Iowa State had came out of the gutters. Respect to Campbell for that. But at some point, you have to see progress as a program. And we simply haven't seen that beyond the baseline level at Iowa State. So he's a good coach, but I'm not sure I would put him in the upper echelon or anywhere near that. Yeah, I mean, like, Jake. That's- that that's a take. I like that. Hey, Emery, I, I Matt, respect, dude. Jay, your thoughts on on all of what we just heard? Okay, I'm a big fan of Matt Campbell, and my introduction to Matt Campbell actually came when he was at Toledo. He brought a Toledo team, and obviously Toledo has been up and down and whatnot. But he brought them, and Jason Candle's done a good job carrying on in his absence mm, in Toledo. Yes. But he brought Toledo to Provo to play BYU, and they played an absolutely epic. I think it was like. It was in the, both teams were in the 50s. BYU ended up winning the game. Jamal Williams went for BYU's single game record rushing in that game. It was nuts. That told me everything I needed to know about Matt Campbell is the dude just knows how to scheme football. That's what I love about him is he will work whatever he needs to to get his teams an advantage. And I think he's done that with uh, Brock Purdy during the time at, I- at Iowa State. Uh, he had some very good teams at Toledo. I'm not going to say he's Sonny Dykes esque. I think he's better than that, but. I think that there was there was a lack there there was a lack of the criticism last year for how they kind of underachieved relative to expectations that was a little bit a bit surprising to me. I I will admit that. Yeah, I think the frustrating quote for me was towards the back end of the year when somebody asked him like you know about what they had accomplished as a team, and he's like, oh, he's like, we haven't. It's not like we have you know we still have stuff we accomplished, and like at that point, the best they could do was like eight and four. And he's like, you know, you know, our goals about, about us as people as it's like, no, you've underachieved. Like you're a five and four team, you've 100 percent underachieved. It, that I didn't love. Which Jones I, I, got massacred for that approach. Yeah. And yes, he did. I, I work in sports radio, and I one of my hosts. He he always talks about the fact when quote when quotes like that come out, when no matter who it is, whatever sport it is, it, it's it's always funny because my my host PK, the guy I work with, Patrick Kinahan, he'll always say, "Yes, they're resetting the expectations, but people know what the real expectations were." Yes, you always yes, you always to be like cognizant of that. And look, Mac Brown, I thought Mac Brown actually did a good job being like, "Yeah, we're not we weren't very good last year." Like, it it can kind of work either way. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong for doing so. John, you got something? Well, I just wanted to add just on to Kalanis Sataki. I, I he's one he's a guy I'd probably put in the top twenty. I mean, you look at the guys that you know CBS Sports has in the top twenty, and I mean, if you're looking at Sataki, I mean, I think he's probably a better coach than Pat Fitzgerald. I mean, Northwestern was good, but then they weren't good. Like BYU, yeah, but Northwestern though. So yeah, like, but they have to stay in success at BYU, and they're playing yeah. a tough schedule every single year as an independent. Like this is a guy that knows how to coach. He gets the best out of his team. Recruiting 
honestly like a small pool, a smaller pool than maybe a lot of other schools are recruiting from. And they still achieve, you know, above expectation almost every single year, winning games that most people may not think they're, they're going to be able to win. BYU is going to be a tough team in the Big 12 whenever they, they oh, get yeah. into, the, into the fold. And I think Sataki is probably a, a top 20 coach. In my, in my opinion, easily, yeah. You, uh, you wait, okay. love you, by the way. <laughs> um, Just if you guys, legit retro hats. <laughs> if you guys want to achieve above what you thought was possible, uh, Built Bar, go to Built.com today. It's Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15. Plenty of flavors available. And not just the built bar we talk, we talk about here. Built Go, Built Boost, uh, all those kinds of things are available. They've got the caramel brownie built bars right now. 130 calories, folks. 17 grams of protein, four grams of sugar only. Um, and here's the thing, guys: like you can eat this before a workout, after a workout, or for dessert. It, it, it's multifunctional. Uh, once again, go to built.com. That is built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15. L O C K E D. At built.com. Seems like we've lost Josh for a minute. He is on vacation and hosting on a sketchy internet access. And I think we got Josh back. We're back. We're good. All right. We're back yeah, here. There you, go. you guys got me? Vamped. Now. All right. Hey, lock15 at built.com today. That's what it's all about right there. That's really what we're talking about. There you go. All right. So uh, we got to get John out of here in a, in a few minutes, but I wanted to show everybody the um, the Athlon Sports. And also, Athlon Sports did four all Big 12 teams. Like, what? What is a four all Big 12 teams? Man? Like, what are we doing here? Thanks for the content, so, though. I appreciate it. I that. appreciate the content. Content, yes. is, content is so, key. Uh, here we go. Can you guys see my screen? Am I sharing the right screen? Yes. Got it. Okay, good. All right. Um, so I, I really just want to do this right here. Spencer Sanders, Oklahoma State quarterback, is number one. Are we just doing this, John, because he won it last year? Like, I think it should be Dylan Gabriel. And I'm a Spencer Sanders guy. I mean, I think it's fine. If you want to look at the the, the Notre Dame game and how he finished that game off and, and project that into 2022, I guess you could see it. Like, he was the first team quarterback in the Big 12 in 2021. Should he have been? I don't know. But, yeah, I think you could go Dylan Gabriel. You could go Quinn Ewers if you are really getting feisty out there because he's got the weapons to probably have a pretty good season in, in 2022. But yeah, it's, it's weird to me. I mean, Spencer Sanders, he's a solid quarterback. But much like my my disdain, I won't say disdain, but my lack of love for Adrian Martinez is the same thing as my lack of love for Spencer Sanders, and that just turns the ball over too much. He's just too yeah. loose with the ball. If he doesn't have four interceptions against Baylor, it's a good chance that they win that game. I mean, he helped get them back into the game and give them a chance at the end, but those four interceptions, they make a big difference in a football game, and i got to have a quarterback that I can trust a little bit to hold on to the football. Emery, I have got some bad news for you. There is not one single Texas Tech Red Raider on the first team offense or the first team defense. Is this a travesty? Is this a a problem or is this the right call? Are you going to be a homer? What do you think here? I mean, I don't know who you would put on the team based off of past production. <laughs> I can tell you that if zero tech players end up on either first team by the end of the year, that will really surprise me because there's the amount of guys like a Taj Brooks, like a Tyree Wilson, uh, Dejon Taylor, Demerson as well, are all guys that have a lot of talent, young guys as well. But I mean, just looking at the depth of the conference, it's not really all that surprising because Tech's offensive line is obviously a little bit inexperienced or at least don't, doesn't have a lot of, te- of a lot of experience at Tech. The quarterback situation, obviously, you have three talented quarterbacks, but I don't think any of them would really have a case for first year in preseason All Big Twelve. And then just looking at the skill positions, like there's no real guys out there that have both the ex- established past or the outlandish potential. I mean, last year was one thing with like Eric Azukama, who I would say if he wasn't on a preseason yes. first team coming into this year would be ridiculous. But I mean, I think it's not the end of the world. But at the same time, I'm putting my hat in the Tyree Wilson case. I think it's going to end up being him as the most likely guy to end up on the first team. Hopefully there's multiple guys, but certainly, I mean, there's too much talent on this team to not have anyone on the teams at the end of the year. But I can understand coming into the year why you would have nobody there in the first place. 
Jake, what 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 guys do you think we would definitely see 110% from BYU on a first team in this league? Is there anybody you're like, yes, that guy would be a, a first teamer? I got three names for you. Uh, one, Isaac Rex, uh, BYU star tight end. He is still recovering from an ankle injury suffered in their season uh, finale against USC, but I think he would be in the mix at tight end there. I think he's a fantastic player. Ben Simmons is a good player, but I think Isaac Rex yeah. – they're with him. Uh, the other guy I would put on that list is Blake Freeland at left tackle. He is going to be a yes. first NFL draft pick. He absolutely would be a first team guy, in my opinion. And then flipping over to the defense for a minute, the other guy I would probably have in the mix there. It, 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 it's kind of a hard sell, but Keenan Peely, he, the BYU defense essentially fell apart and just was not what it was through the first four games of the season after he suffered an ACL injury. He kind of proved his worth by not being on the field for BYU in a way. He looks like he's going to be an NFL guy for BYU. So I think those three guys would probably be in the mix. The one other dark horse for BYU is Puka Nakua. He started to emerge at the end of last year. He probably would need another year to really move into that first team realm at wide receiver, but he is lights out, folks. Pukunaku is a guy to keep an eye on. All right, there you go. There's, there's uh, anybody else? Anything on these teams, John? You got any closing thoughts on these teams? That uh, anything on the fourth team defense that really you wanted to fight about? No, I, I would say that I think you know the guys that they had at wide receiver for the first team, no issue there. All three of those guys are really, really good. I mean, yeah. I can make a case for Marvin Mims being out there, up there as well, but. I mean, the three guys that they put ahead of them, there's no disrespect because Xavier Hutchinson is great. Xavier Worthy is great. Quentin Johnson, we saw last year against Oklahoma, was great. So really, really good players there. So anybody looking for any slight there to Marvin Mims shouldn't have any issue because those three guys are really, really good players in their own right. Uh, Emory, are we going to see Miles Price have a massive season? Because somebody's got to catch the passes, right? I've got to think my, of all the tech receivers, Miles Price is by far the most likely to have a really good season, especially if Donovan Smith wins the job. They had a really good chemistry and connection towards the end of last year. And Price in general looks like if he wins the job, he's going to be taking a lot of the snaps in the slot, not as much depth in the slot as what you see on the outside. So it wouldn't surprise me if slot, if Price had a really good season. But at the same time, I mean, this receiver, the receiving group in the Big 12 was extremely stacked. And uh, one other thing I want to say is I think that it's kind of ridiculous that Spencer Sanders', Sanders is first team over Dylan Gabriel because, I mean, Sanders won it by default last year, just looking at kind of the lack of talent in the Big 12 from a quarterback standpoint. This year, though, Dylan Gabriel comes after two seasons at UCF and obviously an injury short, shortened third season where he looked like a really good quarterback, put up over 300 yards a game passing, obviously had a lot of touchdowns and in general led one of the most high – high-powered offense, you add in Oklahoma's team and the fact that they've got Jeff Levy calling the plays. I mean, it's kind of strange to me to not have Dylan Gabriel over Spencer Sanders, but it is what it is. I was also part of a panel that put Gary Bohannon as the second best quarterback in the Big 12. You were, so which I'm, I'm not, not forgiving you yet for. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not immune to dumb decisions when it comes to ranking quarterbacks. <laughs> All right, that will do it for our show today. Uh, time for plugs. Jake, I'll let you go first. Where can people find you and your work and all of its variety? Uh, check out Locked On Cougars wherever you get your podcast. We're on YouTube just like this. You just search it out, subscribe. We're actually nearing the 1,000 subscriber mark, so a big uh, thank you to all of you for that support. Hopefully we'll get there really quickly. Uh, check it out wherever you get your podcast, Locked On Cougars. Also on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, search out Locked On Cougars. And if you want my, things on, my thoughts on all things sports, my Twitter handle is Jacob C. Hatch. Emery. You can follow the Locked On Texas Tech podcast at Locked On TTU on Twitter. As well as that, you can find us wherever you find your podcast. Also on YouTube, just search it up just like you would on here. And then if you want to hear my takes on random sports things, you can follow me, Eddie Racer 41 on Twitter. Just be careful, though. I've had some rough baseball takes lately. Not a big baseball guy, so it's been kind of exposed there. But Why are you ripping otherwise. takes then Eddie. if you're not a baseball guy? <laughs> you're just going to expose yourself. Exactly, but hey, it's the college, it's the college regionals. I'm I'm just saying, college baseball tournament is as good as it gets. So, I've been watching lots like of baseball. Five hour, last, you like five hour games. Like five just, hour games. Yeah. Like hey, that that Stillwater regional yeah. was insane. They, what was it? It was like 145 total runs across yeah. the entire regional. It's crazy. Boombox, uh, John. We'll find you and your work. 
I don't know. That Stillwater Regional reminds me of my uh, Sandlot games in California. Where <laughs> you don't have a left field. You're hitting everything to right field. Yeah. It's just an open space. You've got like five game. guys playing defense. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at John9Williams for more great uh, you know, takes from your youth of Sandlot ball or lacrosse or some college softball takes as well. You can follow me, uh, the show on Twitter, at Locked On Sooners, on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. And you can read my work covering the Sooners over at thesoonerswire.com. You guys can find me on Twitter at Josh Neighbors underscore. You guys can find the show over at your podcast. Find us uh, YouTube as well, folks. It was a pleasure. Also, uh, our friend Stephen Simcox and Jonathan Davis could not be here tonight. They wanted to be here, could not be here. Uh, I know we're going to be up on Jonathan's feed, so shout out to everybody out there. Uh, But yeah. All right. We'll see you guys next week. See you.